anyway, so uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about my research um, uh, that I've done in collaboration with uh, some of my PhD students and some collaborators elsewhere, um, sort of an intersection of privacy and machine learning. Um, I'll try to sort of alternate um, between, you know, sort of giving a high level uh, overview on the concept and the problems that we're working on, and we'll try to go a little bit more deep um, a little bit deeper in technical details um, and um, you know obviously I'm happy to to, to answer any questions um, both during the talk and uh, at the end of it if needed I can stay uh, a little bit after three as well um, so uh, yeah so okay um, I would actually like to start uh, by trying to not necessarily define privacy in machine learning um, any sort of attempts to define privacy overall um, tends to be sort of a moot point. Uh, privacy, is, it's a little bit hard to define overall, um, <clears throat> but we can start thinking a little bit about um, sort of privacy as a um, sort of leakage of sensitive information that might come from having access to a machine learning model. Okay, so there's going to be uh, in literature, there are many other kind of security and privacy attacks that you might think of, like stealing hyperparameters or stealing um, uh, you know the, the model but in this case we're I'm going to focus on um, uh, leakage of sensitive information from training data um, where an adversary uh, gets that information from having access to to a model okay um, and in this setting most uh, of the privacy attacks that you can see uh, can somewhat be categorized as two kinds. Okay, so one uh, is known as a membership inference attack, where the adversary, uh, the attacker, tries to infer whether or not a specific data point, let's say a record, uh, was used to train to train that model. Okay, and typically here the adversary has some sort of API access to that model. So, for instance, you you know you have. Uh, these cloud providers like Amazon or Microsoft and so on that give you access to like machine learning as a service kind of um, um, applications. Like you have an image and you want to do some you know image classification on that image. You don't want to um, train a model locally. You don't have enough uh, samples. You don't have enough intelligence. You don't have enough capabilities. So you just ask Amazon uh, to, to do that for you, right? And so you submit that image and Amazon tells you this is an image of a cat, right? Okay, so you want to, uh, the adversary here wants to infer whether or not a specific image of a specific cat uh, was used to, to train the model, okay? Uh, so this is an unintended leakage, right? So you, by just having access to the trained model, you should not be able necessarily to, to figure out what images were used to, uh, to train that model. But it turns out that, that it is possible. The second class, the second sort of line of work um, here is, is been, has been to infer what class representatives, um, again, in the training set look like. Okay, and these are these kind of, kind of attacks. I'm a bit oversimplifying because you know there is different flavors, but overall these tend to be called model inversion. So, like I said, you have access to a trained model and you try to invert it, so to reconstruct what were the records that were used to train that model. Okay, so let's uh, zoom in a little bit. Um, uh, we already talked about membership inference. So you remember you want to test whether uh, data of a target beta victim was used to train a model. I mean, I think this, I don't, I, I don't think I have to work really hard to convince you that uh, this is a serious problem from, from privacy, from a privacy point of view. And, and if uh, the, really the fact that your data was part of, of a particular training set is sensitive, right? So um, maybe the example I, I made before, like a picture of a cat, uh, maybe it wasn't necessarily uh, the best one privacy-wise, although, you know, pets deserve privacy as well, okay? Um, <clears throat> but um, imagine if you the, the models that you're playing with are healthcare related, or you know there are specific uh, attributes that you don't want to to reveal. Like let's say your model is trying to predict whether a smoker gets cancer. Okay, so now the fact that you know that my data was part of that uh, of the training set is particularly um, problematic. 
Um, <clears throat> so um, I think the first one, or at least one of the very first attacks in this setting was presented at uh, IEEE Security and Privacy in 2017 by Shokri et al. And they did it for discriminative models. And uh, with some of my collaborators at UCL, some of our students, uh, we actually uh, did it for generative models. And I'll talk about it later in the talk. Um, so overall, actually, membership inference, uh, I take a sort of a side, uh, I make a side remark here, is a very active research area, not only machine learning. So overall, it's, you know, membership inference is kind of like a very easy to explain and it's sort of become a measuring stick to um, to sort of quantify whether or not models leak, right? So whether or not there are privacy issues uh, with, with 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 certain machine learning models. But overall, you know, you you can think of membership inference, you know, sort of in an unrelated setting to machine learning. So just given the output of a function, uh, you want to infer whether a specific data point was part of the input to to that function. And in many cases, that function is aggregation. Right, so you, you might think that, uh, um, you know, releasing for instance, only statistics, like, you know, how many people were in King's Cross station, um, you know, yesterday between 9 and 9.30. Well, unfortunately, now with the lockdown, hopefully not, not too many. Um, you might think that this is, you know, a very good privacy strategy compared to revealing, let's say, the names of people uh, the, that were uh, in that station, but still, you membership inference attacks are possible, right? And in fact, uh, we did some work with, with uh, one of my PhD students, uh, uh, specifically in the settings of mobility data, but you know, membership inference attacks have a long story, long history, even um, in other completely related settings like genomic data and, and so on. And if, you, if you're interested, I'll, I can give you more pointers in, in that setting. So overall, I think, um, you agree with me that membership inference is a well understood, easy to, um, easy to explain problem. And you can actually use it, um, not just as an attack, but even sort of you can turn things around and use it to assess protection. So if you have, uh, if you use things like differential privacy, we'll, we'll talk about it later, you can check how much protection differential privacy technique, differentially private techniques give you against membership inference attacks. Um, so it's a, it's a really good way to kind of check real world um, effectiveness of certain defenses, or maybe you can even use it to establish wrongdoing. So for instance, um, you know, DeepMind at some point was caught uh, using NHS data for um, tasks that were unrelated to what they were supposed to, to do with the NHS data. Um, and, you know, so one of the things that you can do is actually do membership inference attacks to detect this kind of uh, misbehavior, right? So you can check whether a provider has been using data that weren't supposed to, uh, to use. All right. Um, so I hope it's clear. membership inference uh, is clear. If not, like I said, please stop me anytime and uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to, 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 to explain or answer any questions. Um, Okay, so uh, the second class of attacks is um, what, I, uh, what I refer to as inferring class representatives. And, you know, this is really most of my work in this setting where really the focus was on properties of an entire class. So let me explain um, uh, with, with an example. So these are the two main papers that I that I use to explain this uh, uh, this uh, suite of attacks. Uh, <coughs> Fredrickson et al. CCS 2015. It touched on CCS 2017. But so the example, it might seem very uh, naive, but this is actually what, what these attacks do. Uh, so let's say you have access to uh, a gender classifier, and what you, what you want to do is to try and infer more what a male, the picture of a male looks like. Okay. But I, I think, you know, this is it's sort of debatable whether or not this is actually a, a privacy violation in that, you know, the fact that the model learns to, uh, uh, learns features, learns something about the population from which the training data was sample is actually the, uh, the main purpose why, the main reason we, why we use machine learning, right? So some, if, if the model didn't learn that, uh, it probably means that the model wasn't good or wasn't very useful, okay? So the fact that it, that a model leaks what a picture of the male looks like, um, what, even 
though maybe that particular meal wasn't even in the training data set, is not, in my opinion, necessarily a privacy issue. Okay, so um, I had plenty of, let's say, academic fights uh, presenting the, this kind of work. And overall, I believe that we shouldn't define privacy leakage as the adversary learned something about the training data. Okay, so we should, in fact, um, repurpose this a little bit and think of an adversary succeeding in the attack, so having um, problematic information leakage, if, it, if she's able to infer properties that hold for only a subset of the training inputs, but not the entire, the, the whole class, okay? So again, to use this uh, simple example, if I have access to, let's say, a gender classifier, okay, now I'm trying to infer rays of the race of people in Bob's photos, let's say, right? And so a way to, to really make this clear is to say, maybe we can infer properties of that hold for a subset of training inputs where these properties are uncorrelated with, uh, let's say, the main task that the model is trying to learn, okay? Um, so, uh, and, okay, so, um, uh, Okay, and we actually call this a uh, property inference attack. Uh, again, this was already somewhat explored in, in other papers. We did not uh, necessarily come up with a definition of property inference attack, but we did it sort of uh, rigorously in that we actually talk about correlation of features, okay? Um, so some, if, you know, otherwise, if, if you have features that are correlated, you're kind of back to the same to the same um, problem as before, okay? So <clears throat> we'll get back to this. I just wanted to give you like a high level overview of what, what kind of privacy issues we will uh, we'll be focusing on today. So the first uh, line of work, like I said, is membership inference. I'm going to present my work, uh, our work on, um, on generative models, and then move on property inference attacks, which we will actually present in the context of federated learning. Uh, and finally, I'll present sort of some good news, you know, not just attacks, uh, mechanisms to, um, to, to build and train uh, generative networks in a privacy preserving way. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, membership inference. Okay, so like I said, uh, these attacks really uh, work in a setting where the adversary has some API access to, to a model, right? So you have these, uh, you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft uh, kind of providers that have trained uh, some machine learning model and give you, um, you know, API access, maybe even training API, uh, or anyway, prediction API, right? So like I said, you have a picture, you want to classify uh, what that picture uh, looks like. So shortly, I'll show that these predictions are leaky, okay? So they actually leak uh, um, information uh, about the, of the training set. And the idea is pretty simple, right? So um, if you ever played with, you know, machine learning models, you know that one big problem is overfitting, right? So where essentially the model um, um, really memorizes uh, uh, characteristics of uh, uh, samples that were used in training. So that actually assigns more confidence um, uh, to predictions on uh, samples used in training, okay? So, <clears throat> and you can actually really recognize this, okay? So let's say, let's look at the, this example, right? So you want to classify what a picture, uh, what's in this picture, right? So obviously you, you know, you, <clears throat> this is penguin, right? So the, the, in most cases, these models, what they return is actually um, uh, some sort of weights on the possible classes that, uh, uh, that, that the picture might be, um, uh, might be in, right? So it tells you, okay, with 75% uh, uh, probability, this is a penguin, okay? 20% probability, this is a cat, with 5% it's a house or an ocean, okay? Um, so one issue is that um, these predictions look very different when they're, where they're made on um, images that were indeed uh, seen during training. Okay, so in this example here, um, let's say we have a model that distinguishes pictures of cars from pictures of houses. Okay, very simple example. So if uh, when you run the prediction on the red house, 
which was used in training, you see that um, the weight, the confidence assigned to that prediction is very high, like 99%. When you do it on the blue house, which was not used in training, you see that you know, still the label is house, but with a much lower uh, score, okay? Um, so you, the adversary can learn to recognize these differences and uh, essentially use what's called a shadow model um, to learn to, um, to distinguish uh, using these predictions what images, what records were used uh, during training. Okay. So now, um, and this, this was great, you know, the paper actually won several awards. That was really, you know, what we refer to as a seminal paper, right? So we thought, okay, what happens with generative models? Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, distinction between discriminative and generative models, here is a very simple explanation. So in discriminative models, what you do is really you learn to recognize uh, classes. Let's say, uh, you know, especially in, in supervised learning, you've seen a lot enough uh, examples of uh, cats, uh, pictures of cats and pictures of dogs, and then given an unseen um, uh, image, you, the model makes a, a, a prediction uh, whether that the picture is of a cat or a dog. Right? Uh, in generative models, instead, uh, what you do is you learn to you learn the distribution of of, of a data set, um, so and that you can and you can use it to generate samples. Uh, artificial samples um, um, of that that class. Okay, so let's say given you know again um, uh, you know you've uh, you've seen enough uh, examples of uh, of cat, um, and you can learn that distribution and generate a picture of a cat. Okay, so in this example here in this slide, this cat doesn't really exist, right? So this is what the model things um, a cat might look like, okay? Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, with GANs, right? Generative Adversarial Network, um, which can be used to, you know, generate uh, synthetic images, and now deep fakes and, 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 and other things, okay? So the main difference, again, here I'm oversimplifying, but anyway, you, you, get, you get the difference, right? So if you have a um, sort of generative model as a, um, as a service, there are actually several startups that um, several services that now started to uh, to offer this kind of uh, product. Um, so here your query is not really on an image, right? So you actually query something like, please generate a picture of a car or generate a picture of a house or a cat and so on, okay? So this is your query and the answer to your query is like an artificial um, uh, record, right? An artificial picture of a cat, for instance, okay? Which means that really you don't have, uh, here now you don't have uh, these prediction scores, these weights um, assigned by, by the model, okay? So we explored this problem in a PETS 2019 paper called, called Logan, and, you know, we, we start by observing that it's much, much, this is a much harder problem because of the lack of, um, of, of these prediction scores. So we thought, okay, but what if we actually use uh, generative models against the generative models and use the fact that uh, GANs combine a discriminative model and then a, a discriminator and a generator to try to learn the distribution at the same time, adversarially, um, so the distribution as well as the prediction model, okay? So you have, um, this is, you know, essentially what uh, what a gun uh, can, uh, looks like, and you actually try to recognize whether use the gun itself to recognize whether the picture is a uh, um, was part of the training set or not, or was real or fake. Let's say, okay, um, and um, you know, it turns out that uh, it is a much harder problem, um, and the success of the attack really uh, depends on the amount of information, of, let's say auxiliary information, that the adversary might have. So for instance, in what we call white box attacks, where the adversary is assumed to have, um, um, to, to have access to like essentially inner uh, settings of the model. So for instance, like the, um, the discriminator. Okay, so maybe the adversary has hacked uh, partially hacked the, uh, the cloud service or this, that um, information in the model uh, leaked or maybe it was deployed 
on uh, on uh, smartphones and the adversary tried uh, succeeded to reverse engineer um, um, you know the, these details of the model that were deployed on on their smartphone um, so in this setting actually the, the attack works pretty well and you know the attack is is pretty simple to uh, to implement so what you do you you make some prediction of what are uh, possibly uh, say images used to to train the model you you get some scores from the discriminator right here uh, and then you can sort them and take the top ones and this is your guess of of uh, uh, inference of membership inferences you guess that those records with the top scores were part of the training set uh, obviously that's not always possible to have that information so in a black box attack you have no information at all about the model okay so you just really only have this api up okay um so in this setting here it's much harder but you can try to shadow uh that uh, that model try to recreate it and again uh sort of do do the same so we ran a bunch of experiments uh, with many different kinds of data sets uh, so um, you may be familiar with lfw and c410 um, and we also look at uh, so healthcare related application for um, something called diabetic retinopathy data set where you know the goal is to uh, look at uh, scans of uh, retinas and infer whether or not you have um, uh, you have a disease okay uh, we tried different kinds of, of, of models the cgan the cgan and variation of the coder began um, trying to understand whether this would make a difference okay and it actually does to some extent like uh, even in the white box setting uh, we weren't really able to have really good accuracy with bigan uh, but uh, we have very high accuracy with the cgan and variation of the coder you know, we try to investigate a little bit why this happens, but um, you know, none of us are really uh, super expert in the details of all of these models. So we kind of, you know, I'm kind of give up. So it's sort of an open question uh, to me why you have this really big gap in in accuracy. So you can see, you know, with after a few hundred epochs, um, we we get very close to perfect accuracy. Uh, so here, you know, the higher the accuracy. Um, the worse it is for privacy, right? So it means that the adversary is able to infer accurately whether or not a specific image was used to train the model. When we look at black box uh, um, attacks, well, that things are not are not really great. Okay, so we're obviously much better than a random guess. In this in this setting here, random guesses uh, will have a ten percent accuracy uh, because you have essentially one. The way we did the experiments is one out of ten. Uh, images are part of the training set um, so you can see that especially you know in some data sets the accuracy is very is very low like with CIFAR 10 we barely get you know above the random guess um, so um, it's it's a, sort of an interesting find. however uh, we also look at uh, whether or not having some kind of auxiliary knowledge of what training samples look like uh, might help the attack. So um, on the top, so in this in this slide here on the top, we we do um, experiments on uh, the diabetic retinopathy data set. And you can see white box attack again, pretty good accuracy. In the bottom part, we have on with the blue line uh, a simple black box attack, which is really bad, right? So we barely we, we're essentially almost indistinguishable from random. There's really no signal. Uh, that leaks from uh, from access to the model. But when we have some auxiliary knowledge, so we assume that 10% of the training set is known, actually now you can really start to extract some features and, and um, really uh, train this discriminator in a sensible way. And you can see the attacker, the attack um, uh, accuracy is almost close to the white box. In the white box, we actually have, we stole the discriminator. In this black box with auxiliary knowledge, attack is said we only assume the adversary has, I think here it was 10%, um, knows 10% of the records in the training set, so they know what they look like. And so we believe that, especially in this case, in the end, these images are not very different from each other. So even knowing like 10% uh, of, uh, of the samples really helped you a lot. Okay. All right. Um, 
I also want to show you sort of visually uh, <clears throat> how the, the attack um, sort of by by having by running it over uh, more epochs and having increased accuracy, you can see also the quality of the images that you generate start to become a little bit uh, better. Okay. Um, all right. So, any any questions about uh, this first uh, uh, result? No, I don't hear anybody. So, I I assume I it's safe for me to to move forward. Uh, and present the second um, uh, result, which is uh, uh, this concept of property inference. Um, and we will study it in the uh, context of federated deep learning. So this was also published last year, uh, this IEEE Security and Privacy with one of, of, of my former students who now works for Amazon and some collaborators at, uh, at uh, uh, Cornell Tech. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, if you have heard of uh, federated learning, which is sort of uh, an instance of this concept of collaborative learning. So, in, you, you know, in the examples we saw before, you have sort of a central, uh, you have a server, sort of a cloud, a central cloud that, you know, trains the model and holds the model, right? So, um, so it's very centralized approach, right? In in this setting here, instead we have multiple participants that collaborate collaborate with each other to um, build a joint model that can be used to refine um, every participant's local model. So the main idea here is that in some settings you have data um, in, in that is sensitive and you know cannot leave the device or it might be uh, too computationally or uh, bandwidth expensive uh, to you know, send um, every participant's data set to a central cloud. So what you do is you train a model locally on let's say on a smartphone device, and then you only exchange model parameters to build this, this joint model that can be used, like I said, to refine every participant's local model. And so this is a, 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 parad a paradigm that is very much um, now being pushed by companies like Google. Uh, for instance, uh, it is uh, deployed in production for tasks like predictive keyboards. Right. So when you you know on your on your smartphone when you type something like "Hello, how are?", you get a suggestion. Right. What the next word should be. Um, so it should probably should be you, right? So you're probably trying to write hello, how are you? Or when you you know you start to type a word, you see a suggestion of what, uh, how to complete that that word, right? So that those models are trained using federated learning, right? So you have what you type on your device is very sensitive. It might have you know passwords, it might have names or you know things that might be might be very sensitive, and it would be also uh, quite expensive to send everything that you type to uh, a central server, right? So what you do is you train uh, um, a prediction model locally, and then periodically you exchange updates. So maybe when you charge your phone at night, um, <clears throat> your your phone sends some parameter updates uh, to a server, and, and in return gets um, gets uh, sort of these uh, updates from a joint model that can be used to refine the accuracy of your local model, okay? So this is a very hot topic. Um, there's a lot of efforts uh, right now, and every day on archive, you find a paper uh, of a bird, okay? So <clears throat> um, there are essentially not only federal learning uh, as pr proposed by Google that has, been, uh, that has been used. There were other suggestions before, something like we call generative uh, general, generally we call collaborative learning, uh, something like you synchronized uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent. But you know, really the, the cool thing now is the Google federated learning with model averaging. So as you can see in <clears throat> algorithm two, uh, two uh, what you do is really um, essentially uh, aggregate uh, um, uh, model parameters from different clients and, uh, um, and send them back, okay? Um, oversimplifying, but you can see uh, this is uh, the main idea, okay? Um, so <clears throat> we thought, okay, what about looking at uh, these property influence attacks against, uh, um, against federated learning? So here, like I said, we want to infer uh, uncorrelated features of, of uh, uh, each participant's data sets. So if we're training, let's say, a gender classifier, maybe I want to learn 
want to try and infer the race of pictures in one of the participants' um, uh, data sets. Okay. So uh, we have two kinds of attacks. One is passive and one is active. In a passive attack, what we do is really um, you know, just passively save uh, snapshots of, of the joint models at, at different rounds and different iterations, which really is, you know, the, uh, essentially the aggregated gradients. We calculate the difference and we try to infer information based on these gradients. So we, we train a classifier based on, on the gradients. Okay. So here, um, I sorry, I, I should have said it before. Here, what we assume is that one of the participants in federated learning is, is, is an adversary. Okay. So it's trying to infer something that shouldn't infer about other participants' data. Okay. Um, so in a passive setting, so the adversary does runs everything as as uh, as she's supposed to, right? Doesn't change any behavior, um, just saves the snapshots of the joint models. That's, that's sort of the only extra thing that she does. In an active inference attack, instead, your contribution, let's say, to the joint model can also be uh, changed. So it can be optimized, let's say, to, uh, to make the attack um, uh, more accurate. Okay? And so what we do here um, is to actually attach uh, um, to the last layer uh, uh, an, in, um, so an inference um, an inference classifier. Uh, so for instance, here, the main task, which we're trying to learn collaboratively through federal learning is gender classification. So, but the attribute, uh, the property that we're trying to infer adversarially is who is in the picture, like facial ID, right? So we attack, we attach uh, uh, an extra classifier and the contribution that we send to the server, and hopefully you can see, um, is really the gradients on the joint loss. So this, probably will make our um, uh, our attack more accurate. Okay, so we did really a lot of experiments. Uh, as you can see, we played with uh, sort of different kinds of uh, data sets, uh, both images, uh, text, location, and so on, and different kinds of tasks. So like, again, gender, um, age, race, uh, eyewear, age, uh, smile, classification, sentiment analysis. So we, we also play with sort of NLP, uh, kind of tasks or, re or review scores. Um, and so this is the main task that we, we train, that we, we um, tackle collaboratively. And then we have infinite tasks where always the task is uncorrelated to the main task, okay? And we can actually measure the correlation, okay? So we start with uh, um, property inference on image classification in an, with uh, running it over two part in a two party setting and then going like gradually increasing the number of participants. So like I said, you can measure the correlation of features. So for instance, uh, you know, whether you smile and um, uh, whether or not you're, you're Asian, it's really not, those are not correlated features, okay? And um, <clears throat> we can measure uh, the accuracy of the attack using the area under the curve, as you can see, it's pretty high. Uh, we, we're talking about at least 90%. Um, <clears throat> obviously, as you increase the number of participants, the signal that is available to the adversary, remember we're talking about one single adversary and everybody else is, is a potential victim, right? Um, so as you can see, it degrades um, relatively fast, right? So for instance, here we, um, we, we do two experiments. One uh, main task is uh, gender and the inference task is race being black in the blue line. And the yellow line is smile uh, for the main task and uh, inference task is whether or not you're wearing sunglasses. So you can see we start uh, with very, very high accuracy, perfect accuracy with four participants. And then we go down, uh, you know, pretty low um, over like 20 participants or so. Okay. So that tells, it tells us that, you know, as long as you have a, a lot of participants, um, you know, not many tasks are very, very uh, leaky. Um, but one thing I wanted to show actually is a sort of a cool projection of the feature space. So I use these uh, Disney uh, plots. Okay, so here, um, so let me first explain what these plots look like. So this is the, uh, the feature space. As you can see, the red dots are, uh, sorry, the, the circle is uh, the main task. Um, so circle versus triangle determines uh, 
Okay, sorry. Let me start from scratch. Okay, circle versus triangle is used to denote uh, the result of the main task. Okay, circle is female, triangle is male, which this is the main task, right? You want to distinguish, uh, this is a gender classifier, um, so you're distinguishing pictures of females from pictures of male. Okay, and then I use the color red and blue for the uncorrelated feature, uh, uncorrelated property that I'm trying to learn. Okay, so uh, red is not black and blue is black. Okay, so as you can see in the bottom right uh, corner, um, you know, the, the sort of fully connected, connected layer, the model has successfully learned to separate by gender, right? So you can see, uh, you know, the most of the circles are on the left and most of the triangles are on the right. Okay, so success. But when I look at the intermediate layers, uh, so for instance, in the right top uh, plot, pool two, you can see that the model also learns to distinguish by color, by race, okay? Um, so uh, you can see that most of the blue things are sort of on the left and most of the uh, red things are on the right, okay? And so if you can think about it, you, you would assume there is no inherent reason for the model to learn to distinguish race when, they're trying, when it's trying to distinguish gender. Right? So you don't necessarily think about it because gender and race are uncorrelated features and we can actually measure that correlation um, using sort of standard correlation metrics. Right? And we, we actually do and we see that these are uncorrelated features. So it turns out that you know, these deep neural networks, you know, in order, essentially nobody knows what happens in these deep neural networks. Right? So it's a bunch of layers and the models does you know, all sort of kind of crazy things. And you know you just see at the end you get the accuracy um, on some accuracy on the task, even enough uh, epochs. Okay, so now what well, turns out that the model here, in order to really distinguish gender, has to also learn how to distinguish gender for all different kinds of races. Okay, um, so obviously this is you know very delicate <laughs> sort of a, a thing. I, I I don't mean to say anything, but you know. Um, that is wrong, okay. but um, in, it turns out in follow-up work that the model it learns to distinguish race in a gender classifier, even for races that are not even present in the training set. Okay, and uh, I'd be happy to to uh, to send you send you the paper. I, I wasn't uh, an author on that, so it's it's really pretty crazy. Right, so you can actually learn learn features of of, of, of of things that are not even there, essentially. Okay, so <clears throat> on the one end, you think there is no reason why the the uh, the model learns to like memorizes uh, races, but it turns out that probably it needs to, okay, uh, in order to 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 get to that point. Um, and long story short, because the model memorizes these features having access to gradients um, from, uh, uh, from the, um, uh, the federated learning setting means that these features leak and an adversary can, 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 uh, can use that. Okay, okay so any questions about this? No? How much time do I have? Okay, uh, not so much time, so I'm going to skip this. Um, I just want to um, tell you a little bit about uh, possible defenses. Um, so there are sort of standard things that you can try to do. So for instance, select how many, like do selective gradient sharing. So you only um, uh, share like percentage of, of, of some parameters, right? So for instance, here we tried with the main task being the sentiment classifier. Um, uh, and, um, you know, uh, we actually see that even if you share so only 10% of the parameters, uh, the accuracy of uh, the property inference uh, attack is still, uh, still pretty high. Um, there's something blinking. Uh, it's a chat. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. Let me start again. Okay, um, so really what uh, the, and there are other uh, sort of things that we tried that didn't work. Uh, so the only real protection that you get that you can 
uh, think of is differential privacy and in particular it has to be participant level differential privacy not record level differential privacy and it would be a little bit too complicated to explain so i'll be happy to to do it offline uh, to explain the difference between two things but at the time we worked on this um, there were only two mechanisms in literature. There's been some recent work, uh, but nothing major has changed. Um, so essentially what you do is add noise to, to the, um, the contributions to the joint model. And when you have few participants, so in the settings where our, our attacks work, uh, the model uh, fa even fails to converge. So you have to add so much noise that you know, not only the model will have very pure, poor accuracy, but also will even not converge. So it's really useless, okay? Um, so long story short, there isn't much that you can do when you have few participants. When you have many participants, now first of all, the attacks are not particularly great, but even if they they are, even if they are um, uh, great in terms of accuracy, you can't use differential privacy and you know, uh, really towards these attacks. The problem is when you know you see federal learning being um, being pushed, being used in settings with few participants. For instance, like you imagine you have hospitals that have you know ten hospitals that want to collaborate to collaboratively training uh, a model, you know, to, for research purposes or you know to uh, do some kind of uh, healthcare related tasks. So you see a lot of uh, um, articles being published in biomedical journals um, and uh, you know bioinformatics uh, and unfortunately these are not really great uh, examples because um, our attacks uh, show that uh, there is a lot of things that leak okay so now in, in a few minutes i have left i want to you know uh, move away from attacks and and talk a little bit about uh, um, sort of defenses and you know uh, build some some privacy preserving systems um, that uses differential privacy okay so i've already talked about differential privacy a couple of times during the talk uh, i apologize that i'm, I'm now i'm only now defining it uh, but this differential privacy is a is a very elegant uh, definition of privacy where essentially tells you that an algorithm is differentially private Okay. If you cannot distinguish whether or not the algorithm is run on two versions of, of the same data sets that only differ in one record. Okay. So this is what we call neighboring data sets, D and D prime. Let's say D is exactly the same as D prime, but D has my record and D prime doesn't. Okay. So D and D prime only differ in one record. Okay, so I'm running an algorithm on, on these data sets and an adversary cannot tell, cannot distinguish whether or not the algorithm was run on D or D prime, if not for a small uh, uh, epsilon parameter that quantifies the information leakage. And we, in this weaker, weaker notion, weaker definition of differential privacy, we also allow for a small probability of, uh, of it. So that's why we, we use these two parameters, epsilon delta. Okay, so this is a very powerful uh, definition. Right? If, if my algorithm is indeed uh, differentially private, it means that you know really there is nothing that an adversary can tell about you know my data, uh, even if an algorithm uh, was using my data. Okay, and so these kind of uh, these kind of defenses definitely um, uh, address like tackle uh, the problem uh, of membership inference, property inference, and so on. Okay. So how do you achieve differential privacy is essentially by adding noise and there are different ways to, to do that, which I'm going to skip for the interest of time. But um, there are uh, several useful, useful properties of differential privacy. So one is post-processing. Uh, so if I have, uh, if, sorry, if I have a, an algorithm that is epsilon private, if I run for any function computed on the output of this algorithm, I still have epsilon differential privacy. Another very good one is composition. If I have K algorithms, M1, MK, that are epsilon private, then if I compose these algorithms together, I simply have, I have a bound that is very easy to quantify, which is K times epsilon. Um, and, you know, obviously you pay a little bit of a price. So the, I, I should have clarified this, the smaller the epsilon, the more privacy you have, right? Um, in, in this, in this set. Okay. So, 
Um, overall, we try to, to, to look at uh, um, sort of the intersection of differential privacy and generative networks to allow organizations to you know, um, solve the problem that they have whenever they want to or they're requested to uh, publish their data sets. And they don't want to do that you know, in a way that compromises user privacy. So in theory, you know, there's been a lot of work trying to find some sort of magic uh, anonymizer box where you know you put your data and then you know you run some stuff you delete some things you generalize something you suppress uh, you, you you kind of try to mask certain things and then you have sort of a safe version of the data that you can publish okay unfortunately this doesn't really work okay um, so things like k-anonymity give you no real privacy l diversity closeness very weak sort of privacy um, uh, properties. So differential privacy is a good one, but in many cases, uh, unfortunately, you have to add so much noise that you have uh, weak utility, especially when your data set is, has, um, is high, has high dimension. Okay? Uh, so this is, there is a, a sort of a very nice paper talking about the curse of dimensionality. So the idea is here to generate synthetic data sets in a differentially private way. So that I, I have artificial data sets that have statistical properties that resemble the raw data. Um, and I can prove that my artificially generated data does not reveal anything about the real data thanks to the differentially, uh, to the differential privacy uh, definitions. Okay, so this was a, a, a project that we started a few years ago, again, with one of my students and some collaborators at INRIA, uh, where the main idea is to model the data generating distribution training a generative model like a GAN or variational encoder and publish the model along with, with its differentially private par parameters. So I here, instead of generating like data sets and you know, putting them online, I generate a model and then anybody can generate, uh, I publish a model and anybody can generate a synthetic data set with strong differential privacy protections, okay? So main intuition is, was to, uh, cluster data um, first and then um, <clears throat> train uh, generative models using uh, uh, differentially private algorithms and in particular um, you know the um, uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, uh, differentially private stochastic, uh, stochastic gradient descent that was proposed by Abadi et al in 2016. So the main contribution here is to find ways to cluster the data in a privacy preserving way. So this blue um, uh, box here, uh, uh, pri a new private kernel k-means algorithm. So now once I have data in clusters, the amount of noise that I have to add for each cluster is much lower than if I was doing it over um, the, whole, the whole data set. And because these data are more close to each other, okay? So they have, there is less entropy, I have to introduce less noise, okay? So now, I use the composition theorem differential privacy so that if I, each of these K uh, algorithms is epsilon differentially private, I can just have a bound that my overall model when I put all things together and I generate data is still K times epsilon um, uh, differentially private. Um, so I just uh, sort of to conclude, and let me show you sort of visually what this looks like. Yeah, these are very simple um, experiments done on MNIST, which is a very simple data set of handwritten digit, digits. Um, so you can see the original, what the original samples look like. Now I want to, on the left hand side, now I want to try and generate synthetic samples. And so I try, we tried several things, like you can see um, a restricted Boltzmann machines doesn't really, I mean, it, it can, you can tell that these are zeros and ones and so on, but they don't look really good. Then we try variational encoder without any clustering. Not so great, right? So you can see, you can barely tell any image. But when I do the clustering, so I actually have very good uh, quality of, of samples, okay? I mean, relatively good quality for, um, you know, just a few epochs, only 20 epochs, and an uh, epsilon parameter that is relatively low, 1.74. So you can see these are all, uh, so that like the uh, third and the fourth picture have the same level of privacy, 1.74 but you can see how much uh, nicer uh, the digits look uh, because of this intuition of the cluster, okay? Again, I'm oversimplifying, only showing some of the experiments that we had. Uh, so we also do uh, work with location data and some other images, image data sets, but this is really visually, I think, um, explains a lot. 
All right, so um, this concludes my talk. Hopefully I, uh, it wasn't too long. Um, I also wanna thank some of uh, my collaborators, uh, my student, Jamie uh, uh, and Luca, collaborators, uh, George, Vitali and Kongzeng. And um, yeah, so I'll be happy to, to stay online and answer any questions you, you might have. Uh, thank you very much. Obviously, unmute yourself if you want to ask, if you want to ask, if you want to ask questions. Thank you, Emiliano. I have a question. In terms yeah. of the number of the participants in the federated learning case, I think it was mm -hmm. in the slide 31. I was yeah. wondering why the, when the number of participants increase, the success of attack decrease. Yes, it does. So your question is why? Yeah, why? what is the increase? Oh yeah, because the signal uh, is um, it's much weaker because what you get, um, the, what the attacker gets is the aggregated uh, parameters from the server, right? So when you have, let's say five participants, the signal is much stronger. Uh, we're targeting a specific victim, right? So your victim is one out of five and the signal is, uh, is, much, much, is much stronger. When you have 100 participants, the signal from the victim is sort of hidden in the parameters aggregated of 99 other uh, uh, other participants, right? I see. So by a strong, you, you mean that when you have more number of participants, the information of each user will be aggregated with more users and then- Yes, yes. Yeah, so it's, it becomes harder for, for the adversary to train a classifier on that signal. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's Fabio here. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, maybe it's uh, more of a philosophical question, but I was interested in your perspective. Uh, uh, like at the beginning of the talk, you said that in your opinion, privacy leakage is not uh, about the adversary learning something about the training data. But do you think this is because the problem is, uh, would be not even uh, solvable or uh, it's just because you think uh -huh. we, we should be worried about like sort of side channels information that they can, like some extra properties that you, they can get from the data? I think uh, the answer to your question is both. Um, so in that, um, so I, first of all, to me is, I mean, you're giving access to, like you're publishing something, right? So you're giving access to a model to people, right? So you know that these people are going to do something with that model, right? So and learn something from that model, right? So if the, these people are able to learn something about the training data, um, it's not necessarily a privacy violation per se, right? If that's not something that you're you're willing to accept, then you should you should not give access to 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 people. Um, so, like you know, if you have a gender classifier, for sure, uh, I think it, it's 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 really inevitable that uh, people are going to learn what male look like, right? So you have you do enough queries, you see, okay, this is. Uh, I, I send pictures. This is a male. This is not a. This is not a male. Um, you will inevitably learn that, and that's really what is supposed to happen, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's. It, I think it's both, right? Um, so there is actually an interesting. If you just give me a second, um, there is an interesting. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, I forgot the definition. Okay. One second. Uh, one second. One second. Right. So, okay, there is this Dalenius Desideratum. Okay, there was a uh, you know paper from 1977 where mm -hmm. you know th people the theorized the concept of statistical disclosure control. So say, okay, I um, I I'm 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 trying to say that by having giving you access 
to to a model, okay, um, you we should reveal nothing about the input to which it is applied. Then it would have been you know without applying applying to the model. But actually, this is in, there is an impossibility result to that. So mm. that's why I said the answer to your question is both. I think you 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 cannot really do statistical discursion control. Um, so by having access to 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 a model, you're going to learn something. Okay, it, there is it is inevitable. Um, I think really there is provable impossibility result. Uh, mm -hmm. the, so the question again becomes whether you're you're willing to accept that leakage or not. Um, but you know, for me, something that is um, sort of obvious, right? So um, you know, if if the model learns what male features look like. It's, you know, it means that the model is working. <laughs> uh, so that's why we say, I think it's not enough to say that versus learn something about the training set. I think we should really try to focus in, on something that the model, the model learns like extra, right? Something unintended, actually, not, not extra. The right word is unintended, right? Um, so something that you don't really think that would even be possible to, to learn. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, if that's clear, but... Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I think... Uh, clear. Actually, as, yeah. a, as a follow-up, actually, uh, do you think that uh, then in most cases, it, I mean, it should be... I mean, it reminds me of um, the security by security practice in which, like, uh, we decided to disclose all the cryptographic algorithms because the only secret should be the key. Uh, should we yeah. do something... I mean, in your opinion, like, uh, should we do... Some, I mean, uh, I know companies that are even like um, releasing access to models are not necessarily releasing the details of the models, but given also the yeah. existence of these attacks, uh, should we just uh, um, maybe design some sort of uh, open source uh, model sharing by disclosing the details of the model as well? Or, or there is still some sort of, I mean, I think it depends, right? So uh, there is a lot of things that are, you know, open source already, like in terms of uh, data sets or in terms of models. But, you know, there is a lot of uh, uh, sort of business models where really you monetize the fact that you had access to um, training data that nobody else had. Um, and, and also that you have some intelligence in sort of training a model that is more accurate than, than others. Um, so I think it's, um, you know, in, 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 in theory, it would be great to, to have, you know, things that are open source and, you know, um, uh, all the details uh, sort of available, um, but in other settings, that's not possible, right? Um, so I'm not sure, um, you know, the, the analogy on uh, sort of everything is, is public by, but the key um, is an easy one to to to, uh, mm. to achieve in this in this setting because um, I mean there is no key <laughs> yes. so uh, um, yeah and I, I I don't think really it's the parameters of the model that that are you know that are really mm. that are really worried about so there are attacks where you yeah you try to steal the parameters the hyper parameters uh, which might be sort of the business uh, model. Uh, you know, uh, sort of a model is highly optimized for a task, and you know you're giving paid access to to that to that model because you your model is better than others. Uh, but I, I haven't looked at at those uh, those problems actually. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any any other questions? Oh, I see Andrea. Yes. Hi. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the for, for the talk. If nobody asks a question, I, I'll ask you one 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 quickly. Um, sure. You talk about um, main task and inference task, and the inference task you said it's it's uncorrelated from the yes. main task. Uh, 
what do you mean with uncorrelated uh, there? Um, so the inference tax is the sort of the adversarial one, right? So it's yeah. the, the one that the adversary wants to infer. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really the features that are uncorrelated, right? So, um, uh, so uh, like for instance, in uh, the example of gender and race, um, you know, these things are not correlated with each other, right? So if you did, um, I don't know, let me try to think of an example of correlated one. Um, but couldn't gender and race be, be correlated for the algorithm? So it might be uncorrelated for us, but maybe the algorithm uses like a kind of decision tree within its parameters to do a gender, uh -huh. a gender classification down a tree of gender, because maybe it's a, um, a, a race classification, a, a gender classification down a tree of gender, if that is possible. Um, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Um, so, um, um, I think we, we do on the labels. So the way we, we compute the correlation, I think it's Pearson correlation, of course, is on the labels. Uh, so, yeah, you're right in that the algorithm might, might do it, uh, but we're talking about uh, what like you don't necessarily expect with, with respect to the labels, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think you, the, the algorithm does that probably mm -hmm. because we see it like in, mm -hmm. the, uh, in the feature projection, right? So, yeah, so to, to, to clarify is on the correlation is on, on, on the labels, okay. All right? Sorry, yeah, so, you know, there is uh, like in your data set, uh, there is, you know, you cannot infer anything about race by just looking at gender, right? Okay. Um, yeah, for instance. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, thanks, but it's uh, a very good point, and I should have clarified. But yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks for the talk again. Yeah. <clears throat> Any more questions? No, right then, Sarah. I think um, maybe we we, we disconnect. Um, anyway, uh, you yeah. Uh, yeah. Please, if you have any questions or y you want more uh, details on on this kind of work, uh, please you know just send me an email or, or or a message on Twitter or whatever, and be happy to um, to follow up. Um, and uh, thanks for organizing, Sarah. It, it was fun. It was my first uh, remote talk. I hope uh, hope it went okay. Um, and um, yeah, and if you want to work on these topics as well, uh, please let me know. Uh, we have a number of projects uh, ongoing where you know, we can always, uh, you know, have use extra help <laughs> or you know new new projects that we can start if uh, anybody's interested. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>